Okay, hello everyone. My name is Katrine Mikhail and I work for the uh, CTRL office. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to mention a few things. Captioning is available for this session. To turn on captions, there should be an option at bottom of the screen in the Zoom toolbar that says show subtitles. If you do not see it, uh, you can click on more to see that option. Also, there will be an anonymous survey posted at the end of the session, as well as a QR code that can uh, be scanned through your phone. Um, and with that being said, I will just turn it over to our presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Trine. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see all the windows. There we go. Let's move this out of the way. So uh, thank you so much for attending today's session. My name is Eric Schuler. I'm the Senior Quantitative and Computational Research Methodologist at CTRL. I'm in the R part of CTRL. And we're going to talk today about using R for teaching quant methods. Specifically, R Markdown, we're going to be using Quartro instead, but it's essentially next-gen Markdown. Uh, so learning outcomes, I want you to be able to walk away with being able to identify potential solutions to common challenges faced by students using R as a syntax language for statistics, explain the benefits and limitations of R Markdown, and describe how to set up a teaching example and homework assignment in R Markdown. So some common issues that I've seen when teaching quantitative methods is it's just it's information overload. Uh, a lot of students, they'll wait till like the last couple of semesters before taking their quant methods courses. At least that was the case with for me in grad, undergrad. I waited till the last possible minute because I did not want to go anywhere near statistics. Um, I thought I wasn't good at math. I did not want to take it, but I had to as one of my my core classes for my major. I ended up loving it though, but it's it's a lot. It can be overwhelming. And a lot of students are just thinking that they might not be good at math and have that that mentality coming into a class. So add that with the complexity of the material, with the complexity of adding a new computer language, which is kind of just a language in and of itself, it's a lot. It's a lot to, to attend with. So that's a big issue that we need to think about. We also have issues of installing software. How to access the software? Is it through the AU virtual application system? Do they have to buy a copy of the license? Do they have to install it? Will it work on their operating system for their computer? Will it work on a Chromebook? Those are all things we have to think about too. And there's also the cost. So on top of paying tuition and for the course, if they need to buy a copy of the license as well, that could be an added cost too, because now we're talking between $50 for data or SPSS for a couple months to a couple hundred from some other programs. So it can really add up quick. There's also the issue of, let's say that um, a student, they've developed these initial skills on how to use a software, but now they left AU. So the only way to really access that software again is if they buy their own license of it. And if they're no longer a student, now the price has increased dram or dramatically. As well. <laughs> Something else to consider is during a class, who do they go on campus for support and troubleshooting? So um, there's Mass app, there's um, ASAC has a quantitative uh, software support and statistical support. So those are some good options as well. Uh, C2L, we don't provide uh, course support for students though, but happy to talk through instructor with instructors about what are some things you need to kind of think through with this. So those are some common issues. And this is why I'm such a huge advocate for open source statistical software. Um, it's free. Now, forever, they don't have to pay a cent for it, which is great because now we're making it more equitable. They don't have to pay for it for a course. They can continue using it after AU. And this is the reason why I started using R personally, is this was back in, let's see, about 2017 was on my postdoc. Couldn't afford SPSS, couldn't afford SAS on, on my postdoc salary. So I was like, okay, time to learn R. And I really never went back. And I am thankful that I never went back to it. Because it's, I'm able to do a lot more within R compared to other programs. The <laughs> there's also growing demand too for R and for Python in the industry. So commercial software, you still see some SAS, a little bit of Stata every now and then, but primarily, you see a lot for especially within data analyst jobs or data scientist jobs. If you're applying for those types of jobs, you're looking for R and for Python primarily. 
And if you know those languages, then picking up Stata, picking up SAS, it's it's a breeze, to be honest. Within certain disciplines, too, at least within psychology, which is where I'm from, R is no longer, or R is more of the norm now rather than SPSS. So kind of thinking through that, it's really helpful, but there is a learning curve and that's going to be a challenge of itself. The nice thing with open source is developments happen much quicker. I'm able to jump on some of the R forums with the developers, get my questions answered. And sometimes that leads to new code being developed for the, for the program. So it's really, really fantastic. I've done that many times with the Blavon package. And if you learn one syntax language, you can easily learn others. I initially learned uh, Minitab, SPSS, and SAS. Knowing SAS, I was able to pick up R pretty easily and so forth. And also from knowing R, I was able to pick up Stata really quick. So if you know a syntax language, it gets to be quite easy to pick up others. Also just for equity, not having to pay anything for this, being able to download it and use it here at any time, I think it's just really powerful. And then uh, let me go ahead and pull this up as well. Uh, so the one is um, a B article I wrote up. This was back last fall. So there's a link if you're interested. And just about moving art as a primary statistical software for teaching for equity. Um, happy to talk about it. Happy if you have any questions about it too. I'm just, I, if you haven't noticed, I am a huge advocate for open source. All my workshops I do are all open source geared. Um, so there's some strengths within R Markdown, specifically Quattro in R Studio. The nice thing is it can run on Chromebooks. It's a bit of a pain to be honest, but it is possible. <laughs> Second. You can also run on it on it as a tablet. I've done that on a on a Surface Go before. It, it's less ideal, but it's definitely doable. Um, so that's quite possible. The nice thing is you can annotate code. So you have your notes with your syntax all in one file. You can combine code. You can add markdowns, links, images, all within the same syntax or program. And the nice thing is within one file, you can run R, Python, Julia, and other languages. And it's also really good for showcasing results and portfolio. Actually, I have a, um, I have a GitHub page where I have all of like a code repository of all the workshops I do, all public facing. And it's kind of my own little portfolio. So that's always a good thing to consider. So I like to also have students think about whenever you're doing an assignment, think of it as, well, how can I use this to showcase my skills that they're developing? <laughs> you can also break down code line by line for learning rather than an entire R script that's not annotated. So it's not efficient coding, but I think it's more powerful and more useful for teaching. Now there are limitations. Uh, the first thing is you need to, you need to use a tiny tech for setting a PDF. Um, I like to make a video of how to do this. You can also knit to a PDF and then save the PDF beside HTML as a PDF. You can do that. Um, a big issue though is jumping around in the script. This is also true for a Jupyter Notebook. So jumping between the different cells, that's gonna cause an issue because you, you have to keep track of what cells have already been run. So it's best just to keep it linear. There is a big learning curve. It's going to easily spend, what would normally take someone an hour in SPSS, easily spends four or five hours when you first get started. But it's it's part of the it's part of the process of learning a new code or language. There's also some version control can be challenging using Git. But if you have it set up with like GitHub, it works out really, really well. I use GitHub with all my projects within R. That way just reversion control makes it super easy. Um, some things to really consider though, when you first teaching with R Studio or really any language is where students are saving the files, the, the data file, the syntax file. A lot of times this can put in the default downloads folder. So I like to encourage like for every assignment, every activity, it has its own bin in a directory. So you have assignment one, you have a folder for that. Assignment two has its own folder. And then I encourage like opening up our studio on the first day of class and showing them this is how you change the directory. This is how you make sure that the file is being read in properly. So that's a big thing I want to kind of think through. 
every now and then there's problems with knitting to a PDF. Usually it's a LaTeX issue that's not being configured right or an update. So I always tell students don't update in the middle of a class or before major assignments do. So when I, when I teach grad level courses, I use R and I also kind of set it up so they know the benefit early on of a syntax language. What skills are they going to be able to take away? How is this going to benefit them in their career and their profession? And what are how is this marketable for them? That way, it really sets the stage of well, why specifically we're doing this rather than using like Amos or some other point and click program. From there, I also kind of have videos that walk through file locations, <laughs> how to set working directories. So everything from like how to install the programs to opening up a script, to running a script. And that way they have it as a kind of references that are resources they can refer back to. I also recommend like testing your code prior to releasing it because it's so easy to make a mistake then release it to class and then guess what? No one can do anything with it. So like the first couple of classes, what I do is I have a hello world assignment in a walkthrough. It's really low stakes. So they get credit for it, but it helps solidify the confidence in using, like, yo, I can do this, and that it's possible. And that way, if there's issues early on, I can work with them to fix it before it gets, like, too much later in the semester. I also always have, like, an FAQ or a wiki course on Canvas. That way, uh, to post common issues, solutions, and they can help each other out, too. So there's a lot of different ways you can download our, our studio. What I like to use, I use like to use just the posit site. So I'm bring this one back, back up. Where did it go? Oops, sorry, having a little bit of tech issue. Ah, there we go. So what I like to do is I just like to open up Chrome or Firefox and just type in our studio. Easiest way is just go through the Posit website. Uh, Posit, that's they're the makers of our studio. And then you can just go ahead and download our, and then our studio right on the same page. So you don't have to do multiple websites for this. And it's going to automatically read in what OS you're using on the website. So that way it just makes it super easy. And then Quattro, I really like using Quattro for teaching and for assignments just because you're able to knit it and it makes it much easier to work with. So I just type in Quattro into a search engine. And go ahead and click on get started and then download. And it has all these kind of useful things like computations, authoring. So you can, yeah, you can use Jupyter Notebook for this or Studio, VS Code, a bunch of different stuff. There's also a Hello World walkthrough on the Quattro website. So this is really good just for getting started. So what I like to do is I like to assign this where students have to go through, render this document, put in the author information, and then that's the first assignment. That way I know everything's all set up and they're ready to go for the rest of the semester. Let's see. A um, couple things I wanna to mention too, just to backtrack a little bit on strategies is not only about the syntax language, but just the content itself of quantitative methods, because it can be overwhelming. Uh, so I like to set the stage and kind of just say like, and I, I'll tell them first day of class, I did not want to do statistics. I was scared of it. I thought I was no good at math, but then kind of talk about the benefits and that kind of really think through and try to change perceptions that it's, it doesn't have to be a scary thing. We're going to break it down into smaller bits and it's more about, I'm more interested in that they can understand it and they feel comfortable in it. Now, they don't have to show complete mastery of it because I'm even, I'm still learning. But I think it's important just to understand the basic information, why we're doing it, <laughs> and then the, the benefit professionally as well. well so that, that kind of technique um, I learned from uh, Dr. Nate Herr. Loved how he taught quant methods at AU. And I incorporate a lot of that. So kind of just big picture why we need it and really make it so it's more relatable 
and it's not as scary because that's going to be the biggest obstacle is me walking in as a student thinking I'm no good at math. I don't want to do this. So if we can try to pass that barrier, then we're in good shape. So for, um, for homework assignments and class assignments, what I like to do is I like to set up an R markdown file. It has a template where it has some of the code in there, and then students have to fill in the code, run it, and then also have space where they interpret the results. And then they have to send the R script along with a PDF that's been knitted with all the results for submission. And the PDF is nice because I can upload it to Canvas, and then I can create it all in there, and I have everything. I don't have to run anyone's script. I have everything I need right there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to open up an R Markdown script. And we'll start with a, a class assignment, or a tutorial, then a class assignment, just to switch it up a little bit. And we're just going to go ahead and let that load. Okay, so this is using a Quattro a QMD file in just a standard R Studio format. Um, honestly, if you're using Python, you can use R Studio with Python as well, or if you want to use Julia, it's you can change the language so it's no problem whatsoever. That makes it really powerful because actually you can use multiple languages at the same time. Um, I don't recommend teaching that for like a, a basic quant methods course unless you're doing something really advanced because now you're adding so many more moving pieces there. Um, but what I like to do is I I don't code efficiently. For the most part, especially doing like workshops or trainings or tutorials, or even just my own research, I don't trade efficient or don't code efficiently because I like to have detailed notes. So the nice thing within a markdown file like this is everything's assumed to be a comment, and then we have chunks of code. So I switch over to visual. You can kind of see what it looks like. Let's give that a second. And then so we have learning outcomes. This is um, a multi-level modeling tutorial I always do. I have, um, I can put links in here. I have the code, I have a little uh, outline here. And I can put really detailed information like what, what is multi-level modeling? Really give a detailed explanation with citations, information about the data sets. And you can format it, add italics, you could bold things, you could do bullet points. I really like equations. It, it helps me break down and get a sense of what's going on there. So adding an equation in there is super easy. We can also, in the visual one, we can add in format tables, links. Using source code can be a little bit more challenging, but you can just toggle back and forth. Like for example, let's, here's that equation that we saw before for the multi-level. It looks like a lot, but you just gotta play around with it and then it works out great. So let me toggle that back over. Actually, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and knit this. So we can get a sense of what a knitted file looks like. I'm just going to give that a second to run. I'm going to enjoy my tea for a quick second. Okay. It's almost done. Okay, there we go. And so now we have um, the finished one. So we have all the code in there. We have the output. We have detailed annotations. Let me scroll down. So typically when I do workshops in the, actually when I used to do workshops in the past, I would have it be like this, where there's a lot of information. Um, I'm going to be doing a different method for this in the future though. So this uh, fall semester, I'm going to be doing, still doing workshops but it's going to be talking about like a specific type of analysis and it's going to be more conceptual and I'll bring up some code afterwards, but you're not going to have to install anything. Like you don't have to install anything today either, but that way it's more conceptual. So going forward, that's how I'm going to be doing it in the future. But we have the visuals all here. So then I can kind of walk through and explain, well, what's going on in each one. I can explain the code. I can annotate the code. 
I can break it down into smaller bits, explain, well, why do we need the center, and go from there. So again, it's not efficient coding, but it has a lot of information there. That way, folks can really see kind of what's going on at each step. So typically, whenever I run any sort of workshop, this is the framework I would typically use. The nice thing is I can include citations, additional resources at the bottom. All these are hyperlinks, so I can go ahead and use those too. So that's how I like to teach. So typically, like in the past when I've done workshops, I actually don't use a slide deck at all. I just have the code and I go through that and I found that to be effective for what I like to do. But that's my style. And that's, each person's gonna have a different style and that's completely okay. I also wanna say that um, within this material, this is what works for me. Uh, it might necessarily not work for you. So please take it, adapt it, make it yours. I'm a big proponent of open coding, open data. So please take it, run with it, make any adapters. You don't need my permission, just go for it. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this file. And I'm gonna show you what I like to do for homework assignments. So this is a fairly basic one. This is gonna be for regression. And then what I like to do is just have them start by it put in their name. And then usually when I have a sign like a homework assignment like this or an in-class assignment, uh, students can work together, but they have to do it, submit each one, or each student has to submit their, on their own though. So they can't just kind of share a file. But this way, if they're working together, they can ask each other questions, they can help troubleshoot. And so that way it's, it's not an isolation. So you usually kind of give like some basic information, like what packages you need to install, and then the equations with just a multiple linear regression. And then I would take things like this and I would comment it out. And so they would have to then take this and then import the data set. Or I would give them this, but then they'd have to fill in the equation for this. And then they would run it. So let me just go ahead and run all the chunks. that we can kind of see what it looks like. Okay. There we go, that's better. We'll just let that finish running. And it's done, perfect. So the nice thing with this is because everything's a common except for a coding chunk here, then we can go in and they can fill in the specifics and answer questions. Like now they, they've obtained it, so I'd probably We'll leave this as an empty cell. And they'd have to fill in summary, parentheses, the object name to pull up the summary. So that's me checking to make sure that they understand the code and how to get the information they need for this. And then how to use Stargazer. So I'd probably leave a couple of these blank and then either from previous class, I'd show them how to do this or they'd have to pull the documentation and kind of play around with it. I always tell them like Google, Firefox, whatever search engine, that's your friend, because you can really find a lot of really great information there in, in examples. From there, that's okay, what's the p-value? And they would go ahead and they would type it in here. And then they'd assess multicollinearity through VIF and tolerance and say, okay, well, what did you find? So they'd have to then take this output and then interpret it. So that way I can make sure that, well, they can see the output and they can then say, okay, make sense of it. Then a bunch of different diagnostics, kind of showing them that there's more than one way to do this, to check for diagnostics. And then because my background is, I'm an experimental psychologist by training, but my background is in educational psychology for statistics. So I'm a big proponent of squared structure coefficients, beta coefficients. So I'd want them to be able to extract those and then interpret it. So I'd say, okay, print these out. And then for each of these, fill in the following. What is the squared structure coefficient? What's the beta coefficient for each of these variables? And then I'd ask them to type in the equation, filling in the coefficients. And once they've typed that in, so if they change the I1 or the intercept, plug that in. What's the B1 coefficient? And then I could take that and I'd ask them, okay, fill in the equation. 
So I'd probably leave, I would take this and I'd put this here, and they would have to fill in all the coefficients and then these specific example ones. So like if we have a male coded as one, dummy coded, um, age is 14, the X6, the word meaning score is a 1.2, cube score of 6.25, Fill in this equation and then give me the predicted score of visual perception, which is the y hat. And they'd have to do that. I'd also ask questions like, well, did you find anything? Using like a Bruce Thompson's a GLM checklist. And then I also like to include things like uh, sys time and sys information. That way it's kind of a date stamp. This is a quick check. And then what they can then do is they can just take this, they can render it. The big thing is they would have to set up tiny text and I'd have a video of how to do that. They're just kind of installing the package, how to run it to make sure they have LaTeX installed, but keeping it very basic. And then with like a, um, a quick hello world test. We'll give that a second. Well, that's the old one. Uh, there we go. There's the new one. And then they can submit this PDF onto Canvas. And now it's an HTML, so we just convert that over. So even if we can just go ahead and print. And then it's going to go ahead and uh, print to PDF. And that way, if they don't have LaTeX installed, it's not a big deal. We can just say um, ERS. Homework one. Oops, and I saved in the Jupyter Notebook one. That's great. I'm doing exactly what I said not to do for Benning. Oh, well. But if I pull this one up, here's the PDF, because you can easily take the HTML, convert it to a PDF, and you're good to go. But then they can just upload the PDF into Canvas, I don't need to rerun any of the code. It's all right there. And I have checks to make sure that they understand how to do the coding as well as how to interpret it. So that's kind of typically how I would then go ahead and structure like a homework assignment. Kind of give a boilerplate that has chunks already in there. And then they have to kind of fill in either specific information as comments or specific code. Um, so some resources I want to mention. Uh, so actually, um, for the structure, what I'm going to do is um, going to provide some resources, open up to questions, and then there's also going to be a an evaluation link that Katrina's going to put in a little bit. I just want to mention that just uh, just right now. Um, but kind of just want to mention the plan, then opening up to questions and answers. Uh, so for resources, uh, there's an intro to R&R Studio on the software on demand page for CTML. I've actually over some I re-recorded that with a bunch of other videos. So in the next couple of weeks, those are all going to be repopulated with all updated versions. Um, the big thing too is like web searches. So actually sometimes um by accident or sometimes intentionally, I'll pretend to forget something, or sometimes it's actually I forget how to do this in R uh, during a class. I will forget how to do something and I'll pull up Google and I'll show the students like what I how I search for things and how I figure out how to get there. And I think that's an important skill that they realize that you don't have to memorize the language, that you can use online resources. Um, I also allow students to use like ChatGPT or Copilot to try to figure out code and try to work on it. But I also show them like, hey, just be cautious, trust but verify. So they do it with permission and they'd have to be like, okay, try it, but then make sure it actually runs. It's that It's not just... Um, messed up script. But there's a lot out there. There's a bunch of really great communities. That's why I also love open source because there's a lot of great help out there too. Um, So I do want to mention C2L, we don't provide course support. So please, please, please don't send your students to us with the expectation that we'll be able to troubleshoot issues or teach them how to use the software. That's not our role. But if you want to talk through how to teach with Python or R or want to talk through uh, these programs for your own research, I love to do that. So please send me an email. Always happy to do that. 
And then uh, we also have consultation system. This is uh, new for this year. <coughs> uh, so we have uh, in-person consults available as well as virtual. So you can choose. Um, we're limiting it now to 45 minutes. That way, if it's in person, I can go to different uh, offices around campus and I'm not I kind of late to different ones as well. But always happy to chat about this. Always happy to talk about research. I love stats. I love talking about coding. I could probably talk all day about it, um, but I, I also want to take the time to kind of um, hear your thoughts on it. If you have specific questions, uh, just let me know. And that's what we're going to go ahead and put the the link in there as well for the anonymous survey. Um, there's going to be three different... Um, actually, I'll go ahead and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, but we, we are going to have some new uh, research methods talks coming up. Uh, so I'm going to be doing one about confirmatory factor analysis. Um, one, uh, i trying to remember what the other two. One of them is going to be about how to leverage like generative AI in research. Uh, so let me know if you're interested in that too. We'll be posting that soon. And if you're interested in specific tutorials or specific uh, workshops, let me know. I'm also happy to do customized tutorials for your research lab. These um, This would be for a research lab or for you as um, a researcher. They're not meant for a class, though. So I, I don't do class demonstrations or software demonstrations for classes, though. Uh, but if it's for your research, always happy to do that. Just give me advance notice, though. But yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Well, um, one thing I do want to mention, too, if you're interested in the high-performance computer, we just got a new system, just got deployed. Uh, so if you want to use that for your research or if you want to use that for your course, that's an awesome opportunity. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's a free resource. I um, highly recommend it. It is fun to use. I've had fun also playing around with it and getting it up started. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put my email in here too. So please feel free to contact me with any and all questions. Ah, great question. So um, difference between Quattro and R Markdown. Um, great. Uh, so the the difference is there's not a whole lot of difference. Uh, Quattro is a next generation Markdown, so it's a little bit more flexible. You can work with it with uh, with Python or with other languages. Uh, so it's a little bit less restrictive, but the same the same coding for like making comments for italicizing things that you'd use in a Markdown it all carries over to Quattro. It's just a different interface that's a more, it was developed for um, multi-system um, uh, multi system teams. So if someone's using Python, someone's using R, that way it's, everyone can use the same system. Uh, so that was how it was designed. Um, generative AI and teaching R, great question. So um, I did a training for a department a couple months ago that they were switching over from a commercial software to R and they had a lot of code. So what I did was I took some example code and then um, I showed them how to then use something like ChatGPT or Copilot, how to do this in a, a way that you can get the essentially the translation code. So going from SAS to R. The trick is to actually break it down into small chunks of code, like maybe each, I'd say maybe 20 lines of code or so, as long as it kind of makes sense. So I would do, put all of it, <laughs> so I put all of it in at once, it gives you kind of a summary, but then say, okay, translate from SAS, translate this code chunk to R, and it would give me a code. I'd put it into R Studio, and I'd also have SAS up, and I would double check and do a comparison. So then I kind of do one at a time and just make sure it's reading in properly and that it makes sense. Um, the, the potential one with um, a limitation is that I've also seen a way to try to give me back code and I knew it wouldn't work because it's like, that's not how it works. So it's like always trust, but verify. Um, but in terms of a design assignment, I think it's a tool. And I think if you frame it as this is a tool that you could potentially use, but you have to use it responsibly, making sure you're citing it, making sure that it makes sense, that the output makes sense, and again, just being responsible. So whenever I use it, I always put right in and make a note saying that I used it on the state with these certain prompt engineers or engineered prompts, and then 
um, the dates just in terms of like the train and uh, when I was using the training data on that. Um, I think it's like I, I maybe would have a let's see a an assignment just on okay write write engineered prompt or prompt engineers for like copilot to do this in R and report back what it says. And then how can you improve on it? What would you do differently? And I think that's the important part, like, because it's teaching them that it's a tool, but then they can always improve on it themselves. And then it's like a, a starting point. I wouldn't use it as the final piece personally. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if that answered your question. I think it kind of depends on what you're teaching. But I think it's, as long as you're reinforcing it as a tool, they can use responsibly, then that's helpful. I, I started using it recently with some stuff and it's it's been helpful, but I've also seen some stuff like, yeah, that's not right. Good job, Copilot, but not on target. I will say when Copilot fails, it fails amazingly. It's 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 quite funny. But it's like if it's if you're if you didn't want it to and you don't catch it, then that's that's an issue. So again, I'm as with anything, I'm always like trust but verify. And happy to talk through that more. And um you're gonna be talking a lot more about how to use this with encoding at the uh, the future workshop. And uh, I'm gonna really try to delve into this and how do you can really leverage certain prompts to get some good results out there and like also what not to do because it was a lot of trial and error for that so always happy to chat more about that Okay. Thank you so much, Katrina and Tread. Really appreciate it.